Hi, my name is Ron Isler. Uh, one of my favorite movies is Rocky Horror Picture Show. I used to see that when I was younger in Illinois and saw it about 32 times and used to even dress up. I'm Bunny Boudreau from Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Uh, I love the Rocky Horror Picture Show and I've seen it both live and in film and it's really interesting. Hi, I'm Gar Williams and thank you for joining me for my Hollywood Gay Pass series. Now, this is going to be special. You bet it's special because we're going to see one of the first gay contributions to filming in America. Did you know that it was not a very successful musical uh, in London in the 1970s? But no one realized it was going to be the world hit that it became, especially in America. Yeah. He used to dress up. Oh yes, he did. No, I he didn't. He used to dress uh, up. Evil twin. Well, plenty of people did dress up. Let's see this gay milestone. Milestone, milestone my foot. It was more like super fun. Well, he's right. Let's see uh, the Rocky Horror Pictures show and uh, how it all came about. And oh, by the way, I'm the real Gar. Take a look. In the freezing English winter of 1974, cameras rolled in a chilly studio outside London on the musical now known as the Rocky Horror Picture Show. The budget? A monstrously tight $1 million. The director? Jim Sharman, who'd helmed the stage show. Although the play's original cast was little known outside London, many were delighted to be asked to reprise their roles on screen. But Fox executives demanded that the co-starring parts of Brad and Janet be played by Americans. One day, a young couple came in, and uh, the girl's name was Susan Sarandon, and the boy's name was Barry Bostwick. Barry was uh, hot off uh, Broadway from Greece playing Danny Zuko. Hi, my name's Brad Majors. Uh, this is my fiance, Janet Weiss. Come inside. Barry was going out with Susan Sarandon, who um, auditioned with him. Let's get out of here. For God's sake, keep a grip on yourself, Janet. We just went in, auditioned together, and got the part together. They saw us as a couple, the quintessential uptight <laughs> young Americans that we probably were. Well, you got caught with a flat world. How about that? Well, babies, don't you panic. By the light of the night, it'll all seem all right. I'll get you a satanic mechanic. I'm just a sweet transvestite. From transsexual Transylvania. <laughs> the timing was right for O'Brien's campy concoction of sex, <laughs> sci-fi, and rock and roll. By 1976, sexual liberation and gay pride were percolating into mainstream culture. And that April, at long last, Rocky Horror rose from the dead. Oh, Rocky! The same people were going week after week, and they felt an affinity with the film that they had to actually start to do things to be part of it, like uh, talking back to the screen. French! Do you speak French? Oh, so <laughs> Call and response dialogue became a part of the midnight screenings. When someone yelled a good line, it became part of the regular repartee. The casting of Tim Curry contributed enormously to the success of the show. It's very rare, particularly then, then in the early 70s, to hit on someone that was appealed sexually to men and women. This, I think, had a big effect. Why don't you stay for the night? Night! Or maybe a bite. Night! I could show you my favorite obsession. I've been making a man with blonde hair and a tan. And he's good for relieving my tension. I'm just a sweet transvestite from transsexual Transylvania. Hey, hey, I'm just 
extra sweet transvestite. Transvestite. Proud transsexual Transylvania. Sixty-five years ago this month, there was a Hollywood tragedy. Now, the name Carol Lombard uh, doesn't mean anything anymore unless you're a film historian, but to uh, moviegoers of the 1930s, she was a big, big star. Now, she could uh, play comedy. She could play tragedy. She could play anything. She was a truly big star. Now, she was considered glamorous. She was blonde. She was bubbly. And to top off all the fun, she was married to the king of the movies, Clark Gable. Now, let's uh, see the twists of fate that caused this tragedy. January 1942. Soon after Pearl Harbor, Carol Lombard set off on a bond-selling tour, the first by a Hollywood celebrity. Carol was exhausted when she wound up her trip with a speech in Indianapolis. And leaving you now, I want you all to join me in raising your hands and making the sign of victory. The V sign popularized by our famous alley across the sea, Winston Churchill. Heads and hands up, America. Let's give a rousing cheer that will be heard in Berlin and Tokyo. Hours later, Carol boarded an airliner and started home for Los Angeles. Her plane headed over snowbound mountains. At the Gable home waited the wife of a press agent, traveling with Carol, Mrs. Otto Winkler. The telephone was at the, on the table right next to me, and it rang. And I picked up the receiver, and I said, hello, and they said, is this the Gable residence? And I said, yes, it is. And they said, is Mr. Gable there? And I said, no, he is not. They asked me if I could take a message, and I said, yes, I would be glad to take a message for him. They said, well, this is the airport, and we have news for you. Uh, we have news for the plane. The plane has crashed and has gone up in flames, and there's, there's no one survive. And I ran screaming, Clark, 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 please, please, stop. I just got word that the plane has crashed and they're all dead. The following day, a search party reached the site of the crash, high in a mountain range, 30 miles southwest of Las Vegas. The aircraft had collided with a sheer rock cliff, then burned. All aboard were killed instantly. And you, Clark Gable, a citizen of the States, do hereby acknowledge to a voluntary listed this 12th day of August, 1942, as a soldier in the Army of the United States of America for the duration of the war, plus six months. I remember uh, just before he went into the service, uh, in fact, the day before, he uh, came over on his motorcycle and came in, and I was having breakfast with my niece, and he sat down with me, and we, we began to talk, and he said, uh, now, Jill, I'm going in, and I don't expect to come back, and I don't really give a, a hoot whether I do or not. And that you will obey the orders of the President of the United States and the orders of the officers appointed over you according to the law and articles of war, so help you God. I do.